So, moving along then, uh, we come to 1969 when you were made a judge of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. And you sat also as a member of the Court of Appeal, which a position which you held until 1972. 1972 was when you were actually ultimately appointed to the bench of the High Court of Australia. And among the people that you sat with on the High Court bench in those years was, of course, uh, Lionel Murphy, who, whose career ended in mired in controversy. You wrote very interestingly and engagingly about some of the people that you sat with at that time. And you spoke in particular, there was a fair amount of disagreement between Sir Harry Gibbs, who was then the uh, Chief Justice of the High Court, and Lionel Murphy. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? No, I don't think so. I don't think I ought to say anything about that. Um, I mean, I, I, to the extent I've spoken or written about that, that's all I think I ought to say. Those years, nevertheless, were fairly smooth years as far as you were concerned. Were you, uh, did you find the shift to the High Court bench? You did say at one point in one of your papers about it being a rather isolating experience being in Canberra. Uh, I think so. Actually, I think being on the High Court is a rather isolating experience. Mary Gordon uh, said so too. Yes. I mean, uh, much more so than in the Supreme Court. You are removed from the legal community of which you were formerly part although in my case the removal partly occurred when I was earlier appointed Solicitor General. But um, being on the High Court, you, you do find that you're living uh, in almost a secluded world of your own. You have to take the initiative about getting in touch with other people in the profession. Judges generally find that so, but it's much more so on the High Court than elsewhere. And partly caused in the early days by travelling interstate, uh, worse for a Melbourne judge than for a Sydney judge. But for a Sydney judge, you're uh, travelling interstate for a significant portion of time. Fortunately, there wasn't as much wor work in Melbourne as was scheduled, so you ended up being back in Sydney for a longer period than you otherwise might be. Um, but Certainly, when the High Court moved to Canberra, it became even more isolating. And, of course, Mary would be talking about that period rather than the former period. Um, but I agree with what she says. It has its downsides, but on the other side of it, I suppose it, it by just simply the physical location itself, by being in Canberra, it, it I suppose, removed any perception of judges being too close to particular cases in different states? At least there was some upside to be said for that? Oh, I think that's nonsense. Um, I don't see any reason why judges of the High Court are too close to cases just because they're cases that come from their own state uh, or because they see the people who might be in these cases from time to time. Their training as impartial judges overcomes any difficulties of that kind. But it's not merely being in Canberra. It's living in that building. I mean, the building is there like an isolated castle, so to speak. Um, the castle on the hill. Well, it's actually a castle on a lake, <laughs> but not like, you know, the chateau on Lake Lehman. But, uh, but it's almost as forbidding as that because it looks like a 20th century hydroelectric power station. Um, but there are no shops around it. Um, if you go for a walk, you're walk, walking in sort of lonely parklands around the building. If you want to go somewhere, you've got to get a car and travel somewhere. So uh, it's geographical isolation in Canberra itself, apart from being in Canberra, which means you're geographically isolated from real Australia. For you, what was the greatest um, dissonance, if you like, between your career as a barrister and then becoming a judge. Some people slipped into the mode of being judged more easily than others. For some, I'm always interested, for example, in someone like Sir Garfield Barwick, who was very well regarded and known as an advocate. But it was said that in some ways when he came to the High Court bench, he brought a lot of those adversarial qualities and uh, tended to be much more a thinker on his feet than a person who was fond, say, of writing. I think that's a correct description of Sir Garfield. Um, I mean, he was a marvellous advocate, there's no doubt about that. And uh, my feeling is that 
uh, he didn't equal as a judge his reputation as an advocate because he was unquestionably the leader as an advocate. He was the best advocate I ever heard. Um, although I must say I always had a very high regard for Sir Douglas Menzies as an advocate, partly because um, his style appealed to me more. He was more urbane, wasn't more he? More urbane, more sophisticated, um, more sensitive. Um, but he didn't have the elemental force of Sir Garfield. Mm. Michael McHugh, when I interviewed him recently, spoke about uh, a comment Sir Garfield made with regard to Victorian council appearing before him, saying they'd scratch the hairs on every dog. I hadn't heard him say that, but no doubt he did. It seemed to be a comment on uh, his dislike of people who looked for ev each and every tiny detail in a case when he didn't regard them as being the salient points. Uh, yes, I can see that. Uh, I, I think it rather reflected... Yes, it would have reflected that attitude of mind. Um, probably um, best uh, ex exhibited by comparing Keith Aiken as an advocate with Sir Garfield although the two of them got on very well once Keith Aiken was appointed to the High Court bench uh, because they, in some respects, they had a similar outlook in relation to questions. Not all questions, but to some questions they did. But they personified the difference in the styles of advocacy. Did you have much to do with Sir Keith Aiken? He was very highly... Him when he was at bar, not a great deal... Um, uh, but, of course, when he came to the High Court, uh, there had been an intervening period when he'd given up the bar and he'd become a company director. I think he'd become a director of BHP, amongst other companies. Um, and, therefore, I think that period made some sort of difference to him. In a not favourable way? No, no, I, I think in a favourable way. But uh, my impression was that... Uh, probably leavened him to some extent. In other words, um, he may have come across before as rather legalistic. After all, he had been an associate to Sir Owen Dixon, and there wouldn't be any doubt that Sir Owen Dixon was an influence on him in terms of his approach to the law. I think when he became a judge, he was slightly different. Not all that much, but slightly different. I like your choice of the word leavened. Uh, I interviewed this morning Paul Steen, who he felt very strongly about the importance of other experiences in a person's life, contributing to the quality of you, of one as a judge. You have been described as, when you first came to the High Court bench, as being a cautious and conservative judge. And then that perception of you gradually changed. Now, for you, what was the leavening, if you like, that brought about that change in your own approach? Uh, I don't think it was anything that happened while I was on the High Court. Um, I, I think the important thing about appointment to the High Court is that uh, you're appointed to the High Court, you appreciate more keenly than you do anywhere else uh, the shortfall in your own knowledge and in your own experience, and therefore... Uh, I resolved when I was appointed to the High Court that I would be cautious, that I wouldn't be expressing views about questions unless I was completely convinced of the answer to that question, um, which I think is a fair enough attitude to adopt when you're appointed to the High Court, uh, particularly if you're a young judge, as I was. Um, I'm not so sure about the adjective conservative, I wouldn't admit to that as readily as I would to the adjective cautious because I thought that in uh, an early judgment on Section 92, um, uh, I indicated an approach that was different from the accepted approach. Otherwise, I think probably you could say I was more conservative than I was later on. But even then... Uh, I was inclined to think that that judgment indicated that I wasn't altogether conservative. Years ago, I interviewed the late Victorian Governor, Richard McGarvey, mm. and he spoke with some 
forcefulness about what he regarded as the contrast between what he described as black letter lawyers and those who he felt were true to the spirit of the law. He felt that mm. his own experience in politics, because he was very politically mm. active, and even his understanding of economics and things, led him to be, as he put it, much more a person devoted to the spirit of the law and less to the letter of the law. He spoke and felt very strongly about that. Did you have similar feelings? Um, Yes, uh, but let me put it this way. Um, There is a clear distinction between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Um, As time passed, it seemed to me that it was more necessary to give effect to the spirit of the law than the letter of the law. Um, And although um, it seems a bit odd to say it, um, if I were to criticise myself... I would criticise myself, uh, and not just in the beginning, but throughout, as perhaps being too conservative. By that I mean, uh, I'm inclined to think on reflection that I might have given more effect to the spirit of the law. It's interesting you say you criticise that. Uh... But really, could it have been any different? I mean, it would be quite natural for a young judge, as you said yourself. I I think so. I think so. But, I mean, um, when I offer that criticism, I'm really offering that criticism on the footing of, you know, what is the right standard of conduct for the judge, not having regard to the judge's experience or lack of experience at the particular time. What standard do you expect of a High Court judge? It's rather like, what standard do you expect uh, of a licensed driver of a motor vehicle? Yes, that's a good way. That's a good analogy. Now I can see exactly what you mean. 